Good morning. How are we this morning? Excellent. Excellent. Um, we're we're going to finish the Sermon on the Mount today. Yay! Yay! <laughs> but um, the Sermon on the Mount leaves us with a choice. We're given a choice. He finishes with giving his people a choice. And in Joshua, hopefully the words will come up here because I forgot to grab myself a Bible. There we go. In Joshua, we read, Joshua gives the people of Israel a choice. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors. Worship beyond the Euphrates and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Aramites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Jesus finishes with this choice. Not a, well, actually, pretty much the same choice. He's explained the kingdom to us. And he says to us, how are you going to live? Are you going to live the way that I've taught, shown you and taught you and explained to you? Or are you going to continue to live in the way that you have been living? And if you do these, this is what's going to happen. So Rebecca's going to unpack that a bit for us. But we're going to start this morning with a question as we worship. Have you been to Jesus? Have you been baptized? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Let's stand together and sing together. we sing this next verse, somebody's made a choice this morning, and they've decided that they're going to be a local officer. Um, so as we sing the third verse, Ivor and Rebecca are going to get the flag, and I'm going to invite Patience to come forward, and we're going to commission her um, after we sing the third verse. Let's sing together. Lay aside your garments that are stained with sin, and be available to do this for the time that you're with us. Um, 
So, just to recap, oh, it, it has a different uh, thing on here. There's a Bible verse here that God may count you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he will, may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prosperous by your faith. And that's from the uh, letter of Romans. Um, but uh, we read last week. Um, you can be seated. Well, one, one of the things that came out is we've been looking at spiritual gifts, haven't we, over the last, it's more than a year now. We've decided to extend that for an extra year. And um, I think that probably helped play a role in, in you coming to the decision that you have. And you've all done a spiritual gift survey and you all have something you can do here at Catford Salvation Army. You don't, it doesn't mean you have to be a local officer. Maybe it means you collect the songbooks at the end of the service, or maybe it means you welcome people as they come in. But we all have a role to play. So if you feel God speaking to you about a role you could do here in the church, no matter what it is, please come and talk to Rebecca and I. And uh, we're very much in favor of seeing people being active and doing things in the church for your service as part of your service to God. Now, I wonder if I could have a volunteer this morning. Is there anybody? I'm afraid there's no chocolate involved. I know that might be a little bit of a, a, a put off for some people. But uh, is there anybody? And I might need Rebecca's assistance because she knows colors better than I do. Is somebody willing to, to, to be my helper this morning? You're all looking very shy. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sharon. I promise to come from you. Excellent. So hold that. Now, I want you to tell me, what kind of life do you want to have? A happy life. A happy life. Healthy. A healthy life. <laughs> Lovely. Happy and healthy. That sounds That's a, Who could ask for more, really, could they? A blessed life, maybe. Yeah? Yeah. Now, if you were to take that, 
Now, we have a recipe for orange, don't we? If I take a little bit of red, so if you want to have an orange life, a happy and healthy life, there are certain things, actually you should get me a spoon, because I love <laughs> A happy and healthy life, there are certain things you need to put into that life, don't you? So you might need a little bit of red, okay? So that might be, that might be the, the healthy bit. Okay? And you need a little bit of yellow, don't you? So that's maybe a lot of yellow. That's all the yellow we have. <laughs> so perhaps the recipe is a lot of yellow. wasn't a red. What if you were interested in maybe a green activity or something? What would happen then? What would that look like? What they would cook it? That changes your life, doesn't it? The decisions, actually, thank you. The choices we make have an impact on the kind of life we want. If we want a blessed life, if we want a life that's defined by God in his service, or a life that's powerful in, in reaching other people or doing things like that, we have to make that decision every day in the little things that we do. Because when we make decisions that aren't part of that, our life actually becomes something we never wanted or intended it to be. Rebecca's going to be thinking about the choice, our choice in following Jesus. Are we going to take seriously what he's taught us through the Sermon on the Mount? Or are we going to make other choices? And what kind of life are we going to be left with based on that? We're going to watch the Bible Project video and uh, introduce to us our, uh, the themes for this morning. In the first century, an Israelite rabbi began a movement that he said fulfilled the Torah and prophets, which were his ancient scriptures. Jesus of Nazareth announced this movement among the powerless, the sick, and the poor who hungered for a world set right. He called these people to radical peacemaking and generosity, and he called this movement the arrival of the kingdom of the skies. So remind me, what does Jesus mean by the kingdom of the skies? Well, in the Bible, the skies are the ultimate image of God's realm where life and justice prevail. And so heaven arriving on earth means God's goodness, overcoming death and violence here on the land. In fact, the biblical story begins with this kind of heaven on earth place. Oh yeah, the Garden of Eden. Yes, walking with God in the garden, sustained by his love, building a home together. This is the way of life. But there was a gate and a path out of the garden that led away from God's life. Why would anyone ever choose that path? Well, a deceptive creature appeared in the garden who told the humans that God couldn't be trusted and that the good life could also be found by taking this easier way. But this path leads to violence and death. Right, and so the Torah and prophets tell the story about God choosing one family, Israel, and then giving them his Torah, his instruction, about how they can return to God's presence once again, how they could build homes and communities where God can come and live among them, how they could even demonstrate to the rest of the world the way back to God's life. But even with God's instruction, Israel was also deceived and they took another path. Yeah, they were deceived by their own prophets and leaders who claimed to speak on God's behalf. The prophet Ezekiel called them wolves, people who not only take the wrong path themselves, they get others to follow them. Okay, but now Jesus is claiming that God's kingdom has arrived with him. Right. Jesus is creating a new group of Israelites who will take the right path. They'll reject deceivers and build something that lasts if they accept this calling. And so in this closing section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus presents a choice. Enter through the narrow gate, 
Because wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to ruin, and those who enter through it are many. How narrow is the gate and how constricted is the road that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Jesus wants to be clear. The path to life is not easy. It can feel confining at times, and you're likely to face difficult trials, but in reality, it is the way to true freedom. So there will be people who will try to lead you off the path of life? Yes, or as Jesus continues, Watch out for illegitimate prophets who come to you in the clothing of sheep, but inside they are wolves who snatch. Okay, but if they're disguised, how can I recognize them as wolves? Well, pay attention, Jesus says, to how they live, whether their choices produce life and flourishing for themselves or other people or not. By their fruits, you will recognize them. Fruit meaning the outcome of someone's decisions, their way of life? Right. If you're the kind of person whose actions produce diseased fruit, you won't last in God's new reality. Okay, but life is more complex than that. I could produce enough good fruit to fool a lot of people, even fool myself. Maybe, for a while, but you won't fool God, as Jesus says. Many will say to me on that day, Master, Master, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty acts in your name? And then I will declare to them, I have never known you. So someone could imitate the actions of Jesus, but never be known by him? Well, remember, Jesus warned about doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. If our motives are disconnected from our actions, we miss out on the life-giving, intimate connection that Jesus offers with himself. A connection with Jesus himself? Jesus isn't just presenting a choice about our behavior. The choice is about how we respond to him. Will we let him transform our ways to be more and more aligned with God's ways? Or, as he puts it next, where are we going to build our house? On the sand or on the rock? Well, that's a memorable image, but kind of random. Not really. In the Hebrew scriptures, the house of God is the most common phrase to describe God's temple, up on the rocky hill of Jerusalem. It's an image of how God's followers can build a community where God's heavenly presence can reside here on earth just like the Garden of Eden. So then, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, they will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down, and the rivers came, and the wind blew, and they fell upon that house, but it did not fall, because the foundation was on a rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, they will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain came down, and the rivers came, wind blew, and they fell upon that house, and it fell, and its falling was huge. So build places where God can reside and where Eden can spring to life, because ultimately, those places are the only ones that will last. Yes, and just like Jesus said at the very beginning of the sermon, a city on a hill cannot be hidden, so let that light shine for everyone to see. Jesus is describing a new humanity who lives together by God's wisdom and love, creating communities of peace and justice in the midst of violence and death that surrounds on every front. In all the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has given us a bold vision for what this can look like. And through the rest of his own life, Jesus lived out that vision. And he offered his followers the choice to do the same. And now, that choice is ours. I don't know about you, but I look forward to hear what Rebecca has to say about that. Um, the, vo the video paints quite a, a good picture, doesn't it, of uh, Jesus' presentation of a new way of living and our choice to follow that. We're going to uh, come into a time of prayer, and um, 402 in the songbook we're going to use, when I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your loveliness, when all the things that surround become shadows in the light of you, when I found the joy of reaching your heart, when my will becomes enthroned in your love, then all things that surround become shadows in the light of you. I worship you, Lord. 
we're going to open it, I'm going to open it up for prayer. So people just pray as you feel led. And if you find it more easier to pray in your own language, then feel free to pray in your own language. We're in the house of God. God knows your heart and God knows your prayers. So feel free to pray as God's leading you this morning. We're going to sing through twice, Pam, okay? sing it again now we know it when I look into your holiness when I gaze into your loveliness when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you night round the joy of reaching your heart when my will becomes enthroned in your love when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you I worship you offer in our prayers. Amen. Amen. And we thank you that we can meet you as brothers and sisters across the world. Mm. You are our worship and our praise. We praise you in your name today. <coughs> some of them in secret and some of them in the freedom of mm. prayer. Yes. We thank you, Lord, that the voice of prayer is never silent. Mm. There's somebody. 
Let's have somebody else pray. Come on, let's lift our hearts. We're here to worship and praise. Let's come together then, and in our teaching, as we've looked at the Sermon of the Mount, we've seen the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, and let's pray that now together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Some of you seem a bit subdued today. Perhaps your, your week has been busy. Perhaps you're tired. My sister said to me, I'm going to put her on the spot now. My sister's here, by the way, at the back of the hall visiting. And uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm well known for embarrassing people. Um, but, but she said, I'm going to sit at the back because I'm still a bit tired. And just in case I nod off, I don't want anybody to think that it's because I, I'm not. Uh, but my, my sister loves the Lord. And, uh, and we're really glad to have her with us. But we've got, we're, we're going to give in the offering, but we have a song to help us. And uh, it's quite a lively song. 
So uh, I think we should stand up, and if you're inspired by the music to move your hips a little bit, or, or just move in some way, or, or to shake a, a little instrument, you can do so. And it's, um, it's, the song is Hold On, keep, keep Holding On. And it's talking about, you know, keep holding on, the victory will be yours. Just keep holding on, even if things are a bit tough. Let's stand up, and we'll listen to that. And as we do, we can come and give in our offerings this morning. <coughs> Beyond the cloud of suns and shines Beyond the bend the road goes on We've been men the other night A joy comes in the Sunset shines beyond the bend, the road goes on. We bring my end of the night, but joy it comes in the morning. 
Now, Peggy has patiently been waiting for weeks to do the Bible reading because Rebecca keeps saying, will you do the Bible reading? And then she forgets and uh, somebody else does it. So Peggy's going to come and give us our Bible reading and then Rebecca's going to come and bring us the word. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Scripture reading Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 to 29. And that's in on page 972 in the Core Bible. The narrow and wide gates. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. (coughs) True and false prophets. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them true and false disciples. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers, the wise and foolish builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. Amen. Thank you. I want to say thank you to Peggy because um, she's been really brave this morning. God has given her courage. She doesn't find this kind of thing easy or natural to do, but we thank her that she stepped forward in courage with the Lord's help. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your precious word, which is like a treasure in a field that we have found, and we have found it life-changing. And I pray that today, however we've come, maybe we're weary, maybe we're broken, but that your Holy Spirit will breathe through these words of Scripture to us and bring us life this morning and bring us what we need. And we pray that as we open ourselves up to receive your blessing, that that blessing will grow in us and become a blessing for all those that we come into contact with. Amen. 
Now, most of you know that back in the 1990s, uh, my parents uh, lived in the Caribbean for three years. And uh, they had to learn to live differently when they went to the Caribbean. And one of the ways they had to change was in the way that they shopped for food. So initially, they moved over there and they went to a supermarket. And they discovered, actually, there were better ways to shop. But first of all, they went to the supermarket. But it wasn't like the supermarkets here because they would have one kind of breakfast cereal, one kind of milk, one kind of cheese. Now, here in this country, you walk into Tesco's, there's seven different kinds of special K, right? I have to concentrate hard when I go shopping to make sure and buying the right thing. But they had cheese, milk, breakfast cereal. The choice was cheese or no cheese, milk or no milk. Okay? And sometimes they didn't even have that choice because sometimes there wasn't cheese or there wasn't milk or there wasn't breakfast cereal. It was a simple choice and they got used to it. They were okay in the Caribbean, shopping that way, living that way. And then they moved back to England and they went to the supermarket to buy cheese. And they walked through the door of the supermarket to the cheese aisle and had to turn around and walk out again because there were hundreds of types of cheese. And it was overwhelming. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us a choice, and it's a really simple choice. Are you going to hear my words and put them into practice, or are you not? Now, here in this country, in this day and age, we're not used to simple choices, are we? We're used to hundreds of different choices. And maybe this is what we expect from our spiritual lives. Maybe we would like it better if we could just listen to Jesus and not put his words into practice. Or maybe some of his words and pick and choose the ones that we want. Or maybe we want some other choice. Maybe we we'll want hundreds of choices. But Jesus is saying very clearly, it's a simple choice. If you like, it's cheese or no cheese. You're either going to live by these words or you're not. And he presents this simple choice in three ways for us. There are two paths, or if you don't like that illustration, there are two trees, or if you're still not getting the point, there are two houses. First of all, we're going to look at the two paths, or the two gates. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate... For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many that go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Now we went to Venice uh, in September lifelong ambition of mine to go to Venice and on the first day we arrived we had a really difficult day and I said to Michael well, why have we come to Venice you know I've been going on about Venice for years but we, but we got there because all the boat buses stopped working because they were having a regatta in Venice which meant that we had to try and find our way around this city that we didn't know on foot Okay. Now, usually, um, I get lost quite often. I don't have a good sense of direction. I get lost quite often, and usually when I get lost, what I do is 
I go the way that everyone else is going, okay? If they're all walking in this direction, if you come out of a station in a strange city and everybody's walking in this, you, you follow them, don't you? You think, that must be the way, because everybody is going that way. You know, I've lived in, 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 in this area for ages, and I get confused at Bromley South. Can you believe that? I've lived, I've lived here for like, I've been familiar with Bromley for about 40 years, and I get out of Bromley South Station, and I think, which way's the exit again? So I go the way everybody goes, okay? That's what my instinct tells me to do. It's logical, it's obvious. But in Venice, on this first day, that's what we did. We followed everybody else because it seemed obvious. We went down the bigger streets and we followed the crowd. But what happened several times is that the crowd were trying to get to good places to view the regatta. And we were trying to get to the bus station. Okay? So logic and instinct said, go with these people. But we kept going wrong because the obvious thing wasn't helping us in that situation. Now, human beings, we're social creatures. In a lot of ways, we have a herd instinct. Okay, we tell ourselves there's safety in numbers. I do not want to go down a dark alley by myself. Do you? No. You don't. You want to go down the big, well-lit one with loads of people in it. If everybody else is walking this way, the loud voice in my head says, go with them. Because I hate walking alone. I hate being in a minority. Because I think, oh, I must be wrong. I must be wrong. It must be me that's wrong. And what Jesus is saying here goes against our instinct. If you have a choice between two doors, you're going to choose the big wide one, not the pokey dark little one. But what he's saying is the kingdom way, the kingdom path is narrow and difficult and unpopular and there are times when you will be in a minority and you will feel alone and vulnerable. But this is the path that leads to life. The easy path, the popular path, the broad gate, actually surprisingly is the one that leads to destruction. Now, as a general rule, we're all grown-ups here today. We know, don't we, that nothing worth having in this life comes easy. There are no quick, get-quick-rich schemes that are honest. Although we know that. Nothing worth having comes easy. So, don't expect that following Jesus is going to be easy. But it will be worth it because, actually, it is the way that leads to life. And Jesus is saying, although we find this uncomfortable, you know, it's cheese or no cheese. We're going to move on to our second uh, illustration. The next one is the two trees. Because once you've chosen the narrow path, you need to stay on it. And that's hard as well, because there will be people who will try to lead you off the path of following Jesus. And Jesus talks about false prophets. He talks about wolves in sheep's clothing. And this always makes me think of the story of Little Red Riding Hood. 
you know, she goes into her grandma's house with a basket. And when I was little, there was a picture in the book, right? And there's a wolf dressed in grandma's clothes in grandma's bed. And Little Red Riding Hood says, Oh, grandma, what big eyes you have. Oh, grandma, what big teeth you have. And I'm looking at this picture. Even as a child, I'm saying, how can she not tell there's a wolf? How stupid do you have to be? How can you not tell that that is a wolf? Jesus is saying, it's not always obvious who the false prophets are and who are the true ones because they come to you in sheep's clothing. Now, there are two ways of interpreting this. If I was looking out on a field and I saw an animal that was woolly, from a distance, I would think it was a sheep. You'd look and you think, oh, you know, there's a sheep and there's another sheep and there's another sheep. But as you get closer, you look into that animal's face and think, it's not a sheep, is it? You know, you can tell the difference, actually. But there's another interpretation of it because in Israel, shepherds would wear sheep's clothing, okay? And in Israel, the sheep's clothing, the sheepskin cloak, became the uniform of prophets. Because Amos was a prophet and a shepherd. They dressed like shepherds. Okay? So if somebody turns up in your town wearing a sheepskin cloak, they are wearing the uniform of a prophet. So it is not always obvious, even when you get close to them, if they're a true prophet or if they're a false one. And Jesus is trying to help us out. You can't always tell. Okay? You need to choose the right path and you need to stay on it. And there will be people who will try to lead you off the right path and claim to be speaking for God. Sometimes they will even perform miracles and cast out demons in his name and do many wonders. You know, in Jesus' time, there were loads of people. I know, I know it's difficult for us to understand here in England, but there was somebody on every street corner performing signs and wonders. You know, it was part of the culture miracles and exorcisms and, and uh, deliverance it was part of the culture so Jesus says there will be people who claim to be speaking in my name who are doing all these signs and wonders but actually they're trying to lead you the wrong way and this is how you tell the difference by looking at the fruit don't look at the signs and wonders look at the fruit of their lives how do they live? Are they people of integrity? Are they humble? Are they Christ-like? Do they consistently live like somebody who has taken the words of Jesus and applied them? Now, we're not looking for perfection here. Everyone has an off day. But generally, are they consistent in the way that they live? And the last one is two houses. Choose the right path, stay on the right path, and build your life on the solid rock. Now, when I was little, I don't know if everyone else did this, but, you know, we went to Sunday schools. One of the first choruses we ever learned, you know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. That's what I grew up on, you know. And then you do, and the rain came down and the floods went whoosh you know we do all this and it's exciting okay now for years and years I genuinely thought until I was well into my adulthood I mean well into my adulthood I genuinely thought that Jesus was talking about actual houses that Jesus was giving building advice in the middle of the sermon on the mount 
that suddenly, you know, he just thought, oh, by the way, if you're thinking about building a house, make sure you build, you know, I genuinely thought that. And um, we lived in Somerset, and they had built houses on the floodplains. And while we were there, there was a huge flood. It was a national emergency. All these people had to leave their houses. And I'm, I'm in my 40s, and I'm thinking, should I listen to Jesus? <laughs> you don't build on the sand. You build on the solid rock. You know, I genuinely thought he was talking about houses. And I blame it on the chorus because the chorus starts, the wise man built his house upon the rock, you know? It doesn't say, the chorus does not start with, if you hear these words of mine and put them into practice, you are like a wise man. Houses need good foundations, of course they do, but so do lives. Jesus is talking about our lives. Build your life on a solid foundation. Otherwise, when trouble comes, everything that we have worked for will be washed away. It will collapse like a house of cards. Not only do we have to choose the right gate and the narrow path, not only do we have to stay on it, but the whole of our lives need to follow the teachings of Jesus because trouble will come. Trouble is part of life. We live in a troubled world. Trouble will come our way and if we are to withstand it, like the chorus said, keep holding on. Build your life on Jesus, the solid rock. So, it mentioned in the cartoon that Jesus is talking about our lives, but he's also talking about the temple in Jerusalem. In their minds, this was the place where God dwelt. It was built on Mount Sinai, the house on the rock. Okay, so his audience know what he's talking about. It is the house on the rock. And they believed, back in the day, that nothing could happen to them because God was in his temple. Okay? It was where heaven and earth met. So whatever they did didn't matter because God was in his temple and nothing would touch that. Okay? And over the years, Israel got worse and worse and worse, worse than all the other nations around them. There were blood, it was blood in the streets, Ahab and Jezebel and all that. They committed terrible atrocities until Ezekiel came and said, you know, I've had a vision. God's spirit is leaving the temple. And the Babylonians invaded and Jerusalem fell, and the temple was torn down. Now, in Jesus' time, King Herod was rebuilding the temple. And people, again, were starting to think, it's okay. We have a temple again. We are untouchable. But Jesus is saying, you know, God is doing something new now. Jesus himself is the new temple. God lives within him. He is the place where heaven and earth meet. Instead of putting your trust in this building that Herod is building, put your trust in me and my teaching. Forty years after the crucifixion and resurrection, Herod's temple was torn down and the people of Israel once again terribly, sadly, were scattered. The rains came down and the floods came up and the building fell with a great crash. So as individuals we have a choice. Which way are we, personally, individually going to choose? But it is a choice also that affects our communities. What will we as communities choose to put our trust in? 
to build our lives upon because trouble will come. No country is immune. No town or village or borough is exempt. The rain will come down and the floods will come up. And the only way to withstand it is to hang on to Jesus. Everything that you build needs to be built on him. Now, I want to just quickly, because it's the end of the Sermon on the Mount series, just remind ourselves quickly what teachings Jesus is talking about. Because it's hard to love your enemies. It's hard to turn the other cheek. It's hard to go the extra mile, to give, pray, and fast in secret, not to put our trust in what we have in the bank, not to worry about tomorrow, let alone not to get angry with your brother or to think, oh, your neighbor's a bit of all right, isn't he? You know, these are the teachings of Jesus, and they're hard because trouble isn't only out there. Trouble is also in here. And we need the spirit of Jesus if we're going to put the words of Jesus into practice. In Luke's version of Ask and It Shall Be Given, Jesus says, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So it would be easy to read these words of Jesus and say, you know, Lord, I can't do it can't do it I really can't love my enemies and Jesus is saying you know I know that but I can do it and if you choose this gate and this path and this house I will put my spirit in you And we will build your life together on solid rock. Because you are not alone. You will never be alone. Because I will be with you. Even when you're in the minority. God bless you this day. I'm going to hand back to Michael now. I wonder this morning who's in the middle of a storm. whose house is sitting there and you can hear the battering outside and you're wondering if the walls are going to fall in, if everything's going to collapse. Maybe it's circumstances, maybe it's, it's your health, maybe it's your faith itself. I wonder if there are people here where everything just feels really fragile this morning. This morning is an opportunity for you to make a choice. To get back on the narrow road. To find a better place, a firmer foundation to build your house. This morning is an opportunity to respond. And in the last few weeks, we've, we've had people come up for prayer. And I, I want to ask Rebecca and I want to ask Patience if they would be willing to, to come and stand. And Hydrin as well, if Hydrin wants to pray. Sorry, Rebecca's being bossy. <laughs> um, and maybe you just want to come and ask them to pray for you. That God's Holy Spirit will just really come in and give you that strength. Because as Rebecca said, Jesus isn't saying... I want you to do this alone. He's saying, I want you to do it with me. It's hard, so use my power, use my strength to get you through. But if that's how you feel this morning, don't leave 
without receiving that power, don't leave without making that choice. Our next song is 565. All I once held dear, built my life upon. All this world reveres and wars to own. All I once thought gain, I've counted loss. Spent and worthless now compared to this. Knowing you, Jesus. Let's respond as we sing together. All I want held dear built my life upon all this world reveals and wars to own all I once thought gain I have counted lost spent and worthless now compared And I love you, Lord. Now my heart's desire is to know you more, to be found in you and known as yours, to possess by faith what I could. Surpassing gift of righteousness, knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best, you're my joy, my and I love you, Lord. Oh, to know the power of your risen life and to know you in your sufferings to become like you in your death, my Lord. So again. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best, you're my joy, my righteousness, and I Can I ask you to come and pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you knew about this day before we even come to live it or think about it. We have come here to meet with you, to be in your presence, to be touched by you, 
to be blessed by you in many ways that we can't even think about. We thank you that we don't go back the same. We came here excited to meet you, and we are never disappointed when we leave this place. As we go into the world right now, Father, we know you are with us because you dwell within us. We thank you, Father, because you are able. You are so able and so good and full of such love that we can't even comprehend. So we thank you that as we come to this house, and meet with you, we are reminded of how good you are, how faithful you are, and that nothing is impossible and no situation is hopeless. We thank you, Father, because we live different people. We live encouraged, we live strengthened, and we live blessed. So as we go into the world, let us be that city that's on the hill. Let us be the light of the world. Let us be a blessing to other people so they can meet you and ask about you. We thank you, Father, for your blessings. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite Shirai, and he's going to come and bring some announcements for us. Good morning to you all and a warm welcome to you. And as already said, another special warm welcome to you, Cynthia, all the way from Canada. Really good to meet you and to have you with us this morning. Um, just a few reminders. Um, the Christmas party is coming up on the 7th. Um, the timings will be confirmed shortly. But another important reminder that um, from the 1st of December, we'll be having our first Sunday of Advent, and it will also be a toy service. Um, please do continue to remember those in need of prayer. Please continue to remember Eileen, um, Douglas Gardner, Douglas Henningberg, but also Carol and Romick, who are also far from well. Uh, that's all the announcements today. Uh, please do join us for tea and coffee if you can stay. There's just one more thing to add, which I didn't mention to Shirai, and that's to say that Rebecca and I are away for, for half the week today. We're, we're going up to see uh, Elsie and James uh, so they can see their auntie while she's here as well. Um, so I suppose if there's an emergency after Tuesday, try and call Shirai. Uh, and Shirai will ring us if it if it's, uh, requires our attention. Um, but also to say that next Sunday, Hydrin is going to be preaching. And uh, I, believe, I believe we're going to be looking at Eternity Sunday, aren't we? Uh, so that's a new thing to me. It'll probably be a new thing to you. But uh, Hydrin's going to explain it to us, and uh, we're, we're going to worship together next Sunday. And Hydrin's going to be bringing the message, and we look forward to that. Um, our final song. Uh, will be a song that's familiar to, to many of you who, who've been in the army for a long time. 441, there's a path that's sometimes thorny. There's a narrow way and straight. It's called the path of duty, and it leads to heaven's gates. Let's stand and sing together. <laughs>
benediction. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden your heart and bring you peace to your soul this day and all days. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you.